supply side economics. Keynesians come to dominate the world, and I mean Keynesians, not Keynes. The Keynesians come in and they stop thinking about Keynes, and we'll talk about that more. Um, but by the time we get to the 70s, the Keynesians now can't explain what happens in the 70s. And nobody can actually explain the 70s. But ignoring that part, the Keynesian cannot explain what happened in the 70s. In the 70s, we get both inflation and unemployment at the same time. It's called stagflation. Inflation and unemployment at the same time. And the Keynesians and the Classicals cannot deal with the 70s. The first big attempt that we see to deal with this is called supply-side economics. It's also known as Reaganomics because it's associated with uh, President Reagan. I had the joy of um, interviewing President Reagan once, and I spent an evening in a bar with this guy, and this guy is a man named Art Laffer, who is the, the guru of supply-side economics. There's two things, two ways, sort of, to look at this. One is, of course, that there's nothing really new in supply-side economics. It's classical economics with some, some of the elements of classical economics made more distinctive in the theory, but anything you see in supply-side economics, you can see in the classical economics. At the same time, when H.W. Uh, Bush is running against Ronald Reagan to be the Republican nominee for president in... Um, 1980, H.W. Bush refers to this theory as voodoo, and you can see that in uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So how do we take this supply-side theory? Well, the first thing is that where Keynesians are looking at this economy, this big thing that there's a break that the markets don't necessarily correlate with the economy, Laffer's going to say, look, there is no economy. What there are are hundreds of millions of workers and businesses. And we need to look at those workers and businesses, not at some black box called the economy. Number two, based on idea number one, what matters are incentives to individuals. We need to look at what incentives we are creating for individuals. Again, a very basic economic concept, Laffer incentives to individuals. And again, it's a basic classical economic view. Now what's going to come out of this is this idea that the only incentive that really matters for most people are their taxes. And it also gets changed so that the taxes that really matter are the taxes on the rich. That taxes, tax cuts, tax changes for lower income people obviously would provide incentive, but apparently not much, and that really what we need to do is cut taxes on the rich. What's behind this theory? Well, the idea that rich people are the job creators, that you could cut taxes for poor middle class people, but those tax cuts are not going to create jobs. What creates jobs is giving taxes to the rich folks. That money then trickles down to everybody, and that's a very 80s uh, phrase that was used uh, derisively by some people and positively by other people, but the idea is that if you give money to rich folks, that spending by them will tend to be investment spending, which will create jobs and trickle down to everybody else. I put a picture of Mitt Romney in here when he was a candidate for president in 2012, he went around saying he would ta cut taxes for job creators, and it turned out that what job creators meant in his plan was anybody who made more than $250,000 was by definition a job creator, and anybody less than that was not. Again, idea, tax cut, stimulate work, effort, and investment. We work harder. Imagine a really high tax rate. Imagine that the tax rate's 90% on your income. 
Well, what's going to happen? You're not going to want to have a side gig of some kind, right? You're not going to do all those other things you could do. Why would you be an Uber driver if the government's just going to take all that money away from you? We need to create incentives for work effort and for investment and classical economics and supply-side economics says the way to do that is to have lower taxes. At the same time, they also want there to be a flat tax. What you have when you have six or seven tax brackets that we have now is that every time your income goes up significantly, you get kicked into a higher tax bracket, and that means you're going to have to pay more taxes. Another basic element of supply-side economics is deregulation. Rules and regulations for businesses, when you require them to have special trash collection or recycle or you know, clean up what's coming out of their smokestack or whatever, those rules and regulations increase the cost of doing business and therefore likely to cut wages and jobs. Now, inside this theory is something called the Laffer Curve. The Laffer Curve simply says that as tax rates go up, eventually they'll get high enough that they'll stop us from working, that they'll discourage us from working or working harder. And when that's true, if you cut taxes, the government will actually collect more money. If taxes are discouraging us from working, then the way to increase the amount of money the government collects in taxes is to cut our tax rate, which would then encourage us to work. What did we learn? Ronald Reagan on Laffer's advice, did a huge tax cut at the beginning of his term over the first few years. Most economists, not all, but most economists see the fact that the budget deficit blossomed and the government revenues fell as evidence that the tax cut lowered revenue, didn't increase it. Again, not everybody agrees with that, but most economists agree with that. Virtually all economists agree that deregulation has been good for businesses and stimulates businesses. Not everybody agrees, for example, that financial deregulation was a good thing. Not everybody agrees that environmental deregulation is a good thing. But there are certain elements of deregulation that everybody agrees with. And everybody agrees that we need to look at productivity as a fundamental macroeconomic variable. How productive our workers are wasn't thought of as a macroeconomic thing before. It was thought of as a microeconomic thing. But out of supply-side economics, we think of worker productivity as a macroeconomic thing. The other thing that happens to supply-side economics is it becomes associated with the political far right. And I mean far right, which isn't really fair to uh, Laffer. Laffer, like Bill Clinton's work, voted for Bill Clinton, supposedly. Um, John Kennedy is his favorite president of all time. We wouldn't associate Laffer necessarily on the political far right, but his theory gets associated with the political far right. And the current administration, the Trump administration, employs many economists who are um, a students or associates of uh, Laffer. So Reagan, Bush, Romney, and Trump all proposed or enacted supply-side tax cuts, and Obama actually signed off on renewing the Bush tax cuts, though we'd hardly consider him to be on the far right. Since the 1970s, we've deregulated the telephones, the airlines, trucking industry, the internet, the financial sector, and removed many other regulations on businesses, uh, working conditions, environmental regulations, that kind of thing. Um, Reagan removed a lot. Other presidents put them back. Uh, Trump's removing a lot. Who knows what will happen down the road. Um, it should be noted that Jimmy Carter is primarily responsible for the deregulation of the telephones, the airlines, and the trucking industry. That Bill Clinton is the one who's responsible for deregulating the internet and also for the major financial sector uh, deregulation that happened. It happened in the 90s. So this isn't just a Republican thing or just a Democrat thing. It is a both party thing. Everybody understands that deregulation, at least some deregulation, has been good for the economy. There are parts of this supply-side theory that are clearly 
influencing our day to day lives and affecting um, economic theory in general, even though in standard economic theory there's not a, a huge necessarily a huge recognition of it it clearly has impacted uh, modern economics however however it doesn't seem like it gives you a prescription for how things work it certainly doesn't explain this is being spoke in 2018 it certainly does not explain the 11 12 13 years that just have passed through there needs to be more and what are economists going to do well it turns out that economists in starting in the 80s are going to get out their blenders and they're going to take a little bit from all sorts of different theories and put them together in a blender and make something new